Good morning and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, you know that we've been hanging out with explorers and scientists from all over the world who are studying and conserving trees and our forests. So they play a hugely important role on our planet. And so it's very exciting this month to be able to give them a little bit of time and hang out with some of our explorers. So before we meet Narupa today, I want to take a moment and share my screen. We're going to use National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive and just get a feel for where our classrooms are joining us from today. So you should see my screen now. I am in Guelph, Ontario, so here in Canada. And as we start to back up, we'll get to see a few of our classrooms coming into focus. So we have classrooms hanging out with us in Milton and Mississauga today. We also have a classroom joining us from Douglas, Ontario, you can see up there. And if we go out one more, you can see we have a classroom in Chicago and as well a classroom joining us in Virginia. Now we're gonna back out a little bit more. We're gonna head across the Atlantic and we're gonna zoom in here on Bangalore. And that is where we have uh, Narupa joining us from today. So we're really excited to be able to do this hangout. I think we have a nine and a half hour difference right now. So as I stop the screen share, any classrooms who are tuning in live on YouTube, don't forget that you can still get in on the action. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and use the chat sidebar to send us in some questions and we'll work some of those in. And then any classrooms, whether you're watching on, ca on camera today or you're right here with us on screen, take some pictures, share them on Twitter, use the tag at NatGeoEducation and hashtag Explore Classroom because we love to see uh, pictures of classrooms in action. All right, Narupa Rao is joining us. She's an illustrator from India, specializing in documenting native flora, which is plants for those who might not have heard that term before. And she does this through botanical uh, drawing. With her National Geographic Young Explorers grant, she's creating a children's book on weird and wacky plants from the Western Ghats rainforest in South India. So Narupa, it is so awesome to have you joining us live today. We're really excited to learn a little bit more about your work uh, some of the biodiversity, and of course, we're ready with some questions for you. Okay, sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. It's so exciting to be talking to all of you. Um, should I just go ahead and start? Absolutely. Why don't you jump in, and I'll let you know if the full screen worked okay. Okay, just a second. Is that sharing? It is, yep, I can see the map. And then if, you, oh, nice and full screen, we're good to go. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so yeah, this is where I'm calling you from today, Bangalore in the south of India, as Joe said. And I am a botanical illustrator, or I'm, you know, I'm a botanical artist, which basically means that I like to paint plants. Um, so this is the process of me doing making one of my paintings and um, you probably notice a few things first of all you might not be very familiar with this plant it's not something that like a rose or a tulip that you might find at, at your flower market instead i like to find these more unusual wild plants um, this is a fawn that can be found in the jungles and in the areas surrounding the jungles and those are the kinds of plants that i love to paint um, Here's another video. It's um, the process of me painting a leaf. It's a time lapse. And um, so that's another thing you might notice is that these drawings are quite realistic um, because I like people to be able to look at something that they see in the wild and compare it with my drawing and be able to identify it. Um, and another question you might ask yourself is why plants? Um, so I actually do a lot of my work in the jungles of South India, and I'm assuming that most of you haven't been, but if I asked you to imagine it, you probably could. You'd, you'd think of tigers and elephants and peacocks, um, but what about the plants? Um, it could, could you name any of those? Probably not, right? And in truth, most Indian children couldn't either. And that's because in India and around the world, we're experiencing this phenomenon called urbanization, where a lot of people are moving into the cities and the cities are moving into areas that were once rural. And what happens is over time, we lose our connection with nature and especially our connection with our traditional knowledge of plants. So if I were to ask, say, my grandmother, 
uh, what she knew about plants, she could go on, she could talk for hours. And if I asked my mother, she'd, she'd know quite a bit, but probably less. And if I asked my sister, she wouldn't know a thing. Um, so that's why I'm really interested in painting plants. I thought it could be a cool way to combine my passion for drawing with my passion for nature and get people of our generation and your generation interested in plants again. So now I'm going to show you some of the projects that I work on um, in this region of India called the Western Ghats, which, go, which is a mountain range along the west coast of India. And it's, a, it's only about 6% of the landmass of India, but it actually has about 30% of all plants and wildlife found in the country. So it's, it's a really, really rich area, rich in biodiversity, one of the richest in the world. And these are two of my scientist friends who live in that region, Divya and Sridhar. And they actually started off as animal scientists, but they soon realized that if they wanted to help protect the animals that they love so much, they would also have to protect the trees that the animals live off because they rely on them for food and sh shelter and a whole number of other things that we can only begin to conceive of. Um, so Divya and Sridhar actually started trying to restore degraded forests. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of plants that come in from, that have been brought into India from around the world and a lot of them are really beautiful like these flowers you can see, but they are non-native and often tend to crowd out some of the native species and don't let them grow. So Divya and Sridhar like to actually focus on the native trees and they wanted to document them somehow. but. This is kind of the problem that they faced. If you take a photograph of the jungles, it's really difficult to isolate any one of these trees in a photograph. So that's where I came in. We basically painted these trees so that we could isolate them from the back backdrop and allow people to see them. Um, and this is me sitting in the jungle painting one of the trees and in truth, it's, these trees are so tall. They're like 40 meters tall, which is about 26 times my height. And so I couldn't even see them all at once in one shot. I would look at um, the buttress, which is the base of the tree. And then I'd look at the canopy of the tree um, by climbing up the top of the hill. And then in my painting, I could actually combine the two in one, even if I couldn't see it in person in one shot. And so that's how a lot of people would actually be able to see these trees, which you can't see in the jungle. They can see them through these paintings. Um, so these are a few of the trees that I painted for the Vyan Shridhar. Right, so that's that project. And I'll just tell you about another, another project that I'm working on, which is a really fun, exciting way to get people interested in plants. Uh, it's actually my project with my Nat Geo grant. And when I was a kid, my parents took me to the jungles and we spent so much time there that I started to love nature and that's what made me want to protect it as an adult. So with the same reasoning, I, I wanted people like other children to get interested in plants as well. So I thought, what's the best way to do that? I would show them how fascinating plants can be and find some of the weird, weirdest, wackiest plants I could find. Um, so this is a plant called an elephant yam. And it's actually eaten as a vegetable in villages across India, but its flower is what's truly fascinating. You see, it's pollinated by beetles who like to lay their eggs in decaying and rotting matter. So the plant plays, the flower plays a little trick to attract these beetles. It emits the stench of rotting flesh. And the beetles will soon realize this deception and move on, but the flower's work is kind of done because the poll pollen grains will stick to the, the um, bodies of the beetles and when the beetles move on to another flower they'll carry the pollen with them and so pollination is achieved um, and here's another picture we've got two two sets of flowers in here we've got these pretty blue delicate ones on the left which are called bladderworts and we've got these pretty weird looking um, flowers on the right which are called serapija now, if I were to ask you to guess between the two, which which one was a carnivore? Um, you'd, I would I would pick the one on the right if I, if I didn't know. But in truth, it's it's the one on the left. It grows in areas which are really marshy and um, which have like low nutrients in the soil, and so they are equipped with these little bags called bladders, 
which try to they ingest water from the surrounding puddles and with that little organisms um, which the flower then retains and digests so that it can extract its nutrients and the one on the right despite looking pretty freaky and crazy um, is not a carnivore it only it, it does temporarily trap insects inside it but only to get their pollen grain stuck on the insects bodies and then they let the insect out again just to achieve pollination so those are another like two crazy plants um, and finally i just wanted to show you one of my landscape paintings um, from the swamps of india these are called maristica swamps and i don't think we have anyone here from florida or mississippi today but i think if, if any of you know anything about it, you would know how important swamps are in maintaining the amount of water we have in our soil and in preventing flooding because they soak up a whole lot of rain. Um, and this is what the swamps in, in South India look like. And we have a lot of animals in these swamps that you actually can't find anywhere else in the world, like these primates that you can see in the back of the painting called uh, lion tail macaques. Um, but if you notice in my drawing that the plants are in the foreground and the animals are in the background, uh, that's just a little, little something I, I wanted to try and mix things up because as wonderful as those animals are, just for once, I wanted to make the plants the superstars instead. Um, so that's it for me. Um, should we move on to question? Absolutely, Narupa. Why don't you stop the screen share and come on back to us? Okay. All right, you're back. Well, first of all, uh, Narupa, you are incredibly talented. Those are some some amazing, amazing uh, illustrations. I'm thinking to what mine would have looked like, and it would have been pretty embarrassing. So those are pretty incredible. You're very, very talented. And um, you. you know, I love that you're shedding light on 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 plants and how we're losing our knowledge of them because you know what a lot of the students joining today probably don't know is a lot of the medicines that we have and that we use come from plants. And there's mm -hmm. so many more uh, medicinal properties left to be discovered that we don't even know about. So it's really important that we do protect these areas, especially these biodiverse areas. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe one more quick question uh, from me before we start meeting some of our classrooms. Um, they're carnivorous plants, pretty amazing. In the, in the Western Ghats, are there just a few species, how many species, do you know off the top of your head how many species of carnivorous plants there are? Um, off the, I, I couldn't tell you how many in particular, but you know those, the bladder warts which I showed you, there are quite a few different species of them. And then we also have uh, these other, other plants called sundews, which they kind of look like uh, gummy bears, you know, they're red and they've got like these tentacles sticking out like that. Um, and they, they use them to trap insects and then digest them. But that's what's really interesting about carnivorous plants is that often they grow in, in land where the soil nutrition is quite low. And so they compensate, they supplement their diets by taking on insects. Um, yeah, yeah, so you, you can kind of connect the plants to the habitat, which is what's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely an amazing adaptation. And anybody who thinks plants are boring has not done enough research and looked into the plant world because it's, it's pretty wild the adaptations that many different plants have. Yeah. All right. Well, before we start some questions, I just want to give a quick shout out to some classrooms who are joining us on YouTube. We have uh, Ms. Umar's grade fives joining us from Glendale, Wisconsin. We have Ryerson Elementary, some fourth graders joining us uh, in New Jersey. And then we also have Ms. Radcliffe's fifth graders hanging out in Glendale, Wisconsin as well. So don't forget to get some of those questions in and we'll work some of those in. Um, but let's meet our first classroom. So let's go to Mrs. Searson's class. They're hanging out with us, <clears throat> excuse me, in Douglas, Ontario. So third graders. Third grader. How are we doing today, third graders? Good. All right, who's got a question? What plant can live the longest? What plant can live the what longest? Plant can live the longest? <laughs> what plant can live the longest? Um, so uh, plants, plants can live a really yeah. long time. Um, do you know about the redwood trees that you have in in, in California? In California? Yeah. 
those trees can can last about 500 to 800 years so they've been around for a long time far longer than uh you know any human beings definitely yeah it's pretty amazing the uh you can almost follow history with some of those trees if you look at their growth rings you can like mark off different parts in history that those plants have been on earth for it's pretty amazing all right. Yeah, there are some really incredible old trees in New Zealand as well. All over the world, there are, there are trees that have been around for centuries. All right. Let's meet another classroom. Let us go this time. We're going to go to Mrs. Hennigan's group. They're hanging out with us in Mississauga, Ontario. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Mississauga? Good. <laughs> We have one question for you. Zach, if I can. Can you ask your question? What does Venus flytrap? Um, do you have Venus flytraps in India? Flytrap? Uh, Venus flytrap? Okay, so Venus flytraps are carnivorous plants um, which have a, a mechanism mechanism which kind of opens like a mouth uh, with teeth it looks they look like teeth um, and you we don't have them in India no we don't have them but we do have many other kinds of carnivorous plants like if you've learned about the pitcher plant we have some of those in the north of India as well they they look like a kind of jug with a lid and then they trap the insect in and then they digest it inside yeah those pitcher plants are pretty Pretty neat, but not the kind of pool that I'd ever want to go swimming in. <laughs> and then for the class in Mississauga, asked me about the Venus flytraps. They're really cool. You should take a look uh, on YouTube. You can find some cool videos. And so the fly lands inside, and then there's little triggers inside, almost like little hairs. And if the fly touches one, nothing will happen. Sometimes it can touch two, nothing will happen. But if it touches the right number, it's going to close on it. And that's because... Uh, the Venus flytrap doesn't want to waste energy closing uh, if it's just the wind or like a piece of dust or something. So it waits till the right number of little hairs have been triggered and then it closes. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's grab a question from YouTube from one of our classrooms. So let's see, from one of our classrooms. Oh, here's a good one in Wisconsin. They're wondering, how long does it take you typically to complete one drawing? This is from Ben. Um, so the leaves take the longest because the leaves are so complex. They've got so many veins and, you know, they've got the tertiary vein and then, uh, and the, uh, I mean, the midribs and then the tertiary veins and the secondary, secondary veins and the tertiary veins. So they, those take really long. Um, it could take, like, the big one that I showed in my video could take, uh, like, a whole day. Um, and that's for, like, the smaller paintings. But flowers and things, actually, I could finish in a, in a few hours. Uh, but the longest ones are the landscape paintings, which I might take two weeks over. Amazing. And so when you're drawing, say like a two week landscape, you can't you can't be in the field maybe that whole time. Do you take images? Do you do some from memory? How do you how does that work? Um, so we, I take a lot of photos. So we, we, I like to visit them in the wild as far as possible. Obviously, it, um, I can't take that back with me. Uh, but I do take a lot of photographs, and I do a lot of sketches in the wild as well. So um, I, I showed you that sketch of me sketch, um, drawing in the jungle. So all of those trees were sketched on site, and then I'd bring them back to Bangalore and paint them. All right, awesome. Well, let's meet another classroom. Let's go now. We're going to go to Sterling, uh, Virginia. We've got some fifth graders hanging out with us with Mrs. Whippich. Let me get their microphone turned on. Okay. So on what's graders? the most dangerous plant that you know of? The most dangerous plant? Um, well, a lot of plants have posed dangers to, to animals and livestock as well as to human beings. Uh, one of the, the most dangerous plants that I've seen uh, it's called a gloriosa. It's it's a really beautiful flower if you look it up. It's called uh, yeah. It, it's red and it looks kind of like a like a flame. It's got red petals that are actually turned upward. Uh, and every part of the plant is poisonous, um, including like from its 
its stem to its roots and it actually does this as a defense mechanism to prevent herbivores from eating it um, but it's also used in India that people plant it around their houses to prevent snakes from coming in and don't tell anyone but they, it's also used to to kill people um, if, you know you can put a little bit of it in your in people's food and that it could it can be very very dangerous all right great question Another example of amazing adaptations that plants have to be able to protect themselves. Yeah. Uh, let's see, let's go to Chicago, Illinois this time. We've got some third graders hanging out with us this morning. Let's get there. Oh, just I, I wanted to tell them about the Gloriosa. So, this, um, so apparently when you eat it, um, you can experience like hair loss and like you can go completely bald and it's pretty terrible. And it, this flower is found in Africa as well. And it's said that in Nigeria, they actually use it to poison the tips of the arrows. Um, so yeah, that's just a little trivia. <laughs> right, a hair loss plant. That's not one that I ever want to come across. <laughs> All right, Chicago third graders, you guys have a question. Uh, Sophia, can you stand up? What is the biggest plant that you've seen? The greatest? The biggest. The biggest. The biggest. Uh, the biggest. Um, I've actually seen this plant. It's not native to India. It's actually native to South America. No, sorry, I think to Indonesia. Um, but I, I saw one of these flowers in India, uh, which someone was growing themselves. It's called an Amorphophallus titanium. That's the scientific name. And uh, the general name, let me just tell you, I can't remember the, um, yeah, it's called a Titan Arum, uh, but it's basically this humongous, like crazily tall, uh, flower, which again, it, it's related to the, the flower that I mentioned in my uh, talk. And it also emits this like foul smell when it flowers. And you can't, like, you just can't go near it. It smells like a body that's rotting. Yeah. All right. So let's grab another question from our YouTube classes. So uh, Mrs. Radcliffe's class is joining us uh, from Wisconsin. And Let's see. I'm going to put both their questions together. So um, the first one is how long you've been studying plants. And the second one is how far have you traveled to study a plant? What's the furthest distance you've traveled? Um, so I actually didn't study botany. I am an artist. And so I work with botanists who have been studying plants for years. And I try to communicate their knowledge to general people like myself. Um, so I've been doing this for about five years now, and I have a cousin whose name is Siddharth, who's the same age as me, um, and he's <clears throat> he's doing his PhD right now, actually, in, in the States, in Florida, and so we work together on a lot of our projects. Um, and the furthest, most of my work right now is in the Western Ghats, but yeah, so that's the furthest I've traveled, which is not very far. It's maybe about like the, maybe about ten hours is the furthest I've gone. Yeah, but I think that's what's so great about the work that you're doing is, you know, staying local and making sure that knowledge stays within the communities, especially yeah. you know areas where the cities can get up into the the tens of millions. So, yeah, yeah, that's definitely important to focus on the areas close to home sometimes too. All right, let's jump over. We've got some seventh graders hanging out with us in Milton, Ontario. So here in Canada, let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Milton? Hi. Hi. We're ready for you. Okay. Um, what is the what is the craziest bug that has been living on some of the plants you studied? The craziest bug that has been living on the process study. Let me think. Um, I can't. I actually don't know. I can't. I, I've seen a bug which has other animals living on top of it in its fur. That was pretty crazy. Uh, and these carrion beetles, which I showed you on that giant smelling flower, th those were pretty weird. Um, but I can tell you what the craziest plant I've seen living on another plant. Um, 
And there's this, it's actually, it's a very common tree in India and you would know it as well. Uh, you, you, know, you know about fig trees, right? Fig fruit. Yeah, so, and you have these in America as well. So these fig fruit, uh, fig trees actually start to grow on top of other trees when they're little saplings because that's a quicker way for them to get to the sunlight in the jungles where the canopy is really dense. Um, and so the, the, the birds will drop their seeds on the branches of existing trees and then they'll just start growing from there. They'll send their roots down to the ground and their canopy and their leaves upward and they'll slowly strangle that entire tree to death. And you'll see it in the jungle. It's basically just like a column, a cylinder of roots. And the inside where the, where the old tree used to be will be completely hollow. And you can sit inside. I've sat inside one of those. Very cool. I was actually going to ask you about it, if you did have some strangler figs uh, in the Ghats, but you've answered that question. That's that's really cool. And then again, another really neat way that plants have adapted to survive. And you know, we may not see the competition because it takes place in slower times than we're used to. Um, but there's that competition to get to the light, to get to the top, and make sure that you survive. So another really cool example. All right, well, let's take a swing uh, back through. I think, yeah, we've turned on all the microphones, so let's swing back through to some of our classrooms. So let's start back in Mrs. Searson's class and see if they uh, have another question for us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, Mr. What is your favorite plant that you've ever seen? Um, my favorite plant that I've ever seen, let me think. Um, there's a beautiful flower in India, which is called the Nila Kurinji. Um, and it's called, Nila means blue in the, in the local language. So when these flowers bloom, they bloom all at once. So you'll see thousands and thousands and thousands of these flowers covering entire hillsides. And there won't be anything else for miles around you but these carpets of blue. And what's really actually crazy about these plants is that they flower once every 12 years. So if you miss it, you, you, you won't see it in between. Um, so that's probably my, my favorite plant because when, when you see it, it feels like you're in heaven. That sounds amazing. And then is it, is it once out of every 12 years for the whole species or does it just depend on where, um, where it's located, where it started to grow? There, there are a few different species within that genus, which and some will grow, will flower actually once every sixteen years. It's just that the most famous one is is once every twelve years, uh, and they, they do that to attract uh, bees. Um, you know, basically because the bees can't miss miss those flowers, they they won't be able to see anything else. So that's the idea behind it. And yeah, you will find uh, individual uh, specimen of that um, of that species occasionally growing on their own um but no like it, it, and now that their habitat is quite restricted as well to just a portion of india so you will only see it at that time like in in all the regions where it's found it, it'll be flowering at the same time all right uh let's see Alyssa wants to know she's joining us from new jersey mr edwards class um when did you discover your talent for drawing uh, I, I used to draw as a kid. Um, I mean, every everyone draws when, when they're children, right? Um, and then I didn't study it actually in school. Uh, we didn't have uh, art as a subject in school, so I, I didn't get to study it. Um, and I only started properly drawing maybe about five years ago. Um, and that was also when I decided to draw plants. So it all happened at the same time. All right. Um, let's see. Let's turn on uh, Mrs. Whippich's class, grade five. So let me get your microphone turned on again. All right. Do you guys have another question? What age did you decide that you wanted to protect plants? What? Sorry, I didn't hear that. What age did I? What age did you decide you wanted to protect? plants and like do stuff with okay with them. um so yeah uh, i've i've always loved nature like i said and actually i have a lot of uh, quite a few botanists in my family like i said my my cousin is a botanist 
and um, one of my uh, uncles is actually um, he he is a pretty famous botanist in India, and he would go around in our state in the south and document all of those plants, which in those days, which was you know maybe maybe about sixty years was it? no sorry not that long ago uh, yeah about fifty years ago these plants w weren't documented, and he actually has a few plants named after him as well. Um, so my mother when she was a kid she saw all of that happening because it, it happened from her house you know like she she lived in uh, in one of those rural areas and she she would see them all of these scientists coming even from america to help my uncle with uh, my with these projects um and so when she would tell us stories about that it just kind of filled me with excitement and adventure and discovery and that's how i think of plants um so for a long time i i i knew that i had this like deep love for plants um, and when I started to draw which was five years ago when I finished I finished college about five years ago and that's when I started um, taking up art professionally I I just knew that I wanted to draw plants because there are so many of them and they're so endlessly fascinating that I could never get bored and that's that's how I decided I knew I wanted to draw plants and then it was obvious that I, I wanted to try and teach the public about them as well in order to try and protect them. All right. This is Hennigan's class. Your microphone is on again if you guys have another question. The flower with flames, um, has any animal take, uh, took it down? Taken it down, like fought it, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I'm, I, I don't know for certain, but I think possibly like an elephant might be able to because they're so big. Um, but it depends. If you eat it in a small dose, if you, if you eat just a little bit of the plant, even for humans, it's medicinal. So yeah, I could say humans have taken it down. It's used in medicine um, in India and abroad, even in America. Uh, but when you eat it in larger doses, that's when it becomes um, like toxic. All right. Uh, another question from online. Uh, Ariana is wondering, um, what is the most recent drawing that you've completed? Um, the most recent drawing that I completed, let me think. Um, okay, so I'll tell you. I recently went to another city in India called Hyderabad, um, and I was drawing some of the trees that you could, you could find in the city, which are of, which are really old. And I found this massive tree. It's uh, called a tamarind tree. Um, and in about a hundred years ago, there was a big flood in the city of Hyderabad where the water levels arose by about 15 to 20 feet. I don't know how much that is in meters, um, but it's really high. It's like, okay, so it's more than like three times my height. That's, that's how much the water levels rose. And um, so people, hung onto the branches of this tree, 200 people hung onto the branches of this tree uh, until the water levels receded uh, and they, they were safe. They didn't, they didn't get swept away. That was the last tree that I drew. All right, and back to our group in Chicago. Do you guys have another question for us? Oliver. Come on up in the Have you ever been in a point where you were afraid to draw? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So like when, when I'm drawing in the jungles and when I'm sketching the trees, um, sometimes we have to like go quite deep into the jungle and there are, there could be elephants around. And elephants are really lovely animals, but they're also very protective of their territory, especially if they have babies with them. Um, and so you have to be really careful. You have to keep a, a, a guide with you who usually is a lo is local to that area. And because they live in the jungles for so long, they, they, they can hear the, the calls of the birds. And by that, when birds send each other signals about other bigger animals that are in the, in the vicinity, they know to that an elephant is nearby, for instance. Um, so yeah, when that happens, it can be a little bit scary because you kind of have to be ready to run just in case. 
All right, and let's swing uh, back to our grade seven, see if they have another question for us. Um, how many paintings have you painted around in your time painting? How many paintings have I done? So, um, you know, the, the, the trees that I showed you, um, which I helped to document the, the trees in the Western Ghats, so I, we made a book out of those, and uh, that book had alone had eighty paintings, um, and so yeah, that's I I would say I've probably done about two hundred and fifty maybe so far. All right. Well, along that same line of questioning, we had another question online from Olivia uh, in New Jersey, and she's wondering, do you always make them realistic? or do you ever do them maybe a little cartoonish? Do you ever kind of change it up a little bit? Um, so if the, the, sometimes I do if the plants are more well known, um, but when the plants are not very well known, then I try to keep them realistic because that way people will be able to figure out what the plant looks like. So for, for instance, if I was drawing a rose and if I drew it pretty cartoony or a sunflower, you'd you would still know that it's a sunflower because you know what a sunflower looks like. But if I'm drawing this wilder plant that people haven't seen before, um, if I if I drew it cartoony, you might not be able to tell what it was. So that's I don't take too many you know creative liberties when I'm drawing uh, more uh, rarer unknown plants. All right. Well, Narupa, one more question that I was just thinking about. The Western Ghats, obviously there's a lot of pressure in India. The population, uh, I believe, is over a billion now. Um, how well are they protected? Is there a big, a big push? Are people really interested in seeing this area of incredible biodiversity protected? Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's a difficult question because India is one of the most populated places in the world. Um, and, but Interestingly, it also has some of the highest level of biodiversity in the world for plants and animals, which means that somehow humans and animals and, uh, and are learning to coexist. Um, so Indians do have a natural tolerance toward um, different species because they're, so, they're, they're quite used to living alongside uh, these species. Like I know for uh, instances where, of people where um, a little baby elephant has run into someone's house in the jungle, knocking down the wall, and the mother has run through that same, like knocking down the house even further in search of her baby. And um, this couple who live in that house were, were sleeping in bed, and suddenly in front of them there are these two elephants who have just like ruined the entire house. And then the elephants escaped. Um, but when my friends who are, who are elephant scientists, when they asked uh, the couple how they felt about it, um, the lady said, that's what I would have done for my child. So people are, can be very understanding. On the other hand, it is, there are a lot of pressures because there are so many people and they want a place to live as well. Um, but yeah, there are, some, there are both sides, I would say. There's conservation and there's also a lot of um, degradation because the Western Ghats are so valuable. There's, there's a lot of uh, resources there that uh, are very commercially valuable. All right. Well, Narupa, a huge thank you for hanging out with us today. It was great to learn some more about your work. Uh, really awesome to see some of your illustrations. And do you have a, a rough idea of when you think the book might be completed that you're working on now? Yes, I've actually finished working on the book. Um, and so right now we are uh, going to go through with uh, publishing and printing. So sometime uh, in like around June is when it will hit the shelves. All right. Well, amazing. Congratulations. Classrooms, a huge thank you for hanging out with us today and your great questions. Don't forget, if you took any pictures today, whether you're watching online or you're right on camera with us, post them on Twitter, uh, tag at Nat Geo Education, hashtag Explore Classroom. And again, Rupa, thank you so much for hanging out with us. That was uh, awesome today. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. So I'm just going to turn on the class through microphones, boys and girls, if you want to get <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone for hanging out, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Explore Classroom. Have a good day, everyone.